It is easy to get discouraged serving the Lord. That's a true statement. Most of us start serving the Lord with ministry visions of sugar plums dancing in our sweet little heads. We all begin with these grand dreams about what we will do for God. I know I did. But things don't turn out the way we thought. You can become discouraged. You, you can even just want to bail on God. There have been times in my ministry when I wanted to sign up for the National Association of Disenchanted Pastors. But you need to hear that the charter member of that group, the patron saint of that group, is the Apostle Peter. Because there was a time in Peter's life after three tight, intensive years of ministry with Christ that he was totally disenchanted and ready to bail on the whole thing. We meet Peter in this particular situation at the end of the Gospel of John. Open up to John chapter 21. Christ intersects the discouragement and the despair. And he shows up on the scene to confront Peter. And Christ's analysis of Peter's attitude is not a matter of the externals in which he finds himself. The analysis is that Peter feels this way because he has lost focus. And Christ calls Peter back to the focus of ministry. So John 21, beginning in verse 15, we read these words. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because he asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. It was a matter of focus. For us, we get out of focus because we think that serving God is, is about being an elder or being a deacon or about becoming a preacher or about all of the people in the church or about how I actually feel right now or how I don't feel right now or about the applause that I receive. And that is way out of focus. Because what Jesus Christ was telling Peter is that ministry was about one thing. It is about loving Jesus. And if Peter really loved Jesus, then he would find in his love for Christ enough motivation to get back on track and back in ministry again. Now, I want to point out that there is a significant language barrier for us here. In the English language, we only see the word love, but there are two different Greek words that are being employed. We all know about agape love, and many of us have heard of phileo love, brotherly love, or family love. Agape love is the highest kind of love. That is what Jesus asks Peter the first two times. He says, Peter, do you agape me? And Peter responds both times. Yes, Lord, I phileo you. In other words, Jesus is asking, Peter, do you love me unconditionally? Are you willing to die for me, Peter? And Peter responds, Lord, I love you like my brother. 
And finally, Jesus asks Peter the last time, Peter, do you phileo me? And we think Peter was hurt because he asked him the same question three times. But that is not it. It is because he asked the third time if he even does love him like a brother. And finally, Peter responds, Lord, you know all things. You know I agape you. Now, I tell you all of that because our English translations do us a disservice on this particular text. But I don't want you to miss the overarching principle. The overarching principle is that Peter had lost focus. He lost his love for Christ. The principle is this, that my loyalty for ministry grows out of my love for Jesus. That is the point of this text. And what I think is really frightening is that you and I can become so busy doing ministry, doing all of the right things, working really hard to try to do good for God, and God doesn't feel loved by us at all. That is a very spooky thought to me. Somehow my ministry can become about duty and not devotion. I remember back in Bible college when money was always tight. It always seemed there was a a lot more month left at the end of the money. But I believe the, the FTD ad that said if I would buy my wife a dozen roses and bring them home and present them to her, then she would swoon in my arms and live in abject submission to me for hours, weeks maybe. Who knows? So I stopped in at the florist. I bought a dozen red roses. I walked into our apartment in married student housing and I handed them to her and she took the roses and she smelled them and she said, boy, they're really pretty. And she walked into the kitchen. That was not the response that I was expecting. So I followed her into the kitchen and I said, don't you like the roses? And she said, I love them. They're very nice, but I just have to ask you, how much did they cost? <laughs> now, maybe some of you have studied this. We did with several couples in the church. We studied the whole love language thing. I, uh, that's where you have this way of speaking and receiving love in a particular way. And maybe your wife has a love language that is different from yours. And that is when I discovered that my wife's love language was not mine. And after 24 years of marriage, I have discovered that her love language is actually a lot more expensive than flowers. She wants really expensive things like my time and my complete unfiltered attention. But that's another sermon. But you need to know that Christ has a love language. And one of the aspects of his love language is that when we care about what is precious to him, he knows that he is loved by us. And that is what serving God is all about. In fact, isn't that an essential of love? Love communication is learning to care about the things the one we love cares about. Don't we send loud love messages when we share a mutual concern for what the one we love is concerned about? That is the essence of what Christ is drawing Peter to here. He is saying, Peter, ministry is about loving me. And my mind races to Revelation 2 to the church at Ephesus. You have heard that letter where Christ applauds the church at Ephesus for doing so many good things. In fact, he lists how hard they work and that they they have persevered. They do not tolerate false doctrine. And as we read through that list, we would vote for the church at Ephesus to be the church of the year. It is a grand list of wonderful credentials. And then Christ says something I never want to hear him say of me. He says, but I have something against you. 
That is a frightening thought. I mean, we revel in the truth that if God be for us, who can be against us? Did you ever turn that around? Christ said, I have something against you. And this is what he had against the church in Ephesus. That you have left your first love. Now, some of us are prone to think that in this text is this sense of first love, which is how we felt when we first got saved. We, we really loved Jesus. He was so good to us then, and we, we just felt so wonderful about him. And we got to try to get back to, to try to feel good about our love for Jesus again. That is not what this text is saying. The original language demands that it is not first in time, but first in priority. That Jesus Christ is the priority love of my life. And therefore, everything that I do, I do for him and because of him and unto him because I love him. It is a matter of motive in serving God. It is is that drive of your heart. That because you love Christ, you you do it all, and you will do it all for him. So Peter is queried by Christ in a triple quiz. Peter, do you love me? Then minister to my lambs. Tend to my sheep. Sheep are vulnerable animals. If you know anything about them, you know that they are fragile. They have their little legs broken very easily as they run across the rocky fields. They're not very trainable. And when's the last time you went to a circus and saw a sheep stunt? You can't train them. They really are actually quite boring. They stand around. They eat grass. But guess what? They are his sheep. And they are precious to him. In fact, when this was written, the sheep comprised the wealth of the shepherd. For it is the people to whom we minister that are Christ's wealth. They are precious to him. They are the ones for whom He died. And you have to know, it's not about the sheep. It is about Jesus and him alone. Loyalty in serving God is born out of the womb of a heart that loves Jesus. There is nothing more. There is nothing less. That is what serving God is all about. By the way, if that is your focus, you will never be discouraged. You will never be disenchanted. You will never be disillusioned, disoriented, or disgusted because Jesus is worthy of everything. And he never disappoints. So that is what Christ called Peter back to, back to focus. Now, I will have to say that if someone asks you the question, do you love me? There is a lot of meaning in that question. I mean, if you come home And you've been serving God all day and your wife walks up to you with a sparkle in her eye and she says, honey, do you love me? It probably means she bought a really expensive dress while you were gone. (laughs) Or maybe she wrecked the car while you were gone. But if she walks up to you and looks at you with a depth of, of seriousness and she looks right into your eyes and she says, do you love me? me. In fact, she says it twice. Then you know there is a problem. So to just look at John 21 and hear Christ intensely grill Peter, do you love me? You know that that is growing out of a problem. And we really don't understand these questions or the background of these questions until we understand the actual context. And the context goes all the way back to the beginning of John 21, where we read that Jesus Christ appeared to the disciples again for the third time. And then it introduces us to Peter. 
And it says, and, and here's the problem. It says that Peter said, I'm going fishing. He said this to Thomas and Nathaniel and James and John and two other disciples. And they said, nifty idea. We're going fishing too. Now, some of us who want to be idealistic about everything and never have a negative outlook will say, well, they're just taking a day off. I mean, lighten up on Peter. I doubt it. Because if it was just a day off, I think Christ, who himself went away and rested at times, would, would come along the beach and he would say, how are you guys doing? Are you having a good day? But he comes along and he grills Peter about whether or not Peter loves him. So to me, it's bigger than a, a day off. I, I firmly believe that Peter was basically saying, and if I could parenthetically put into the broader context that Christ has been crucified, he has risen from the dead, but in that same time since the resurrection, he's only showed up twice. And they have been used to steady 24-hour exposure a day. They, they don't even know where he's been. He just shows up. So I firmly believe that Peter is very disenchanted with ministry, with, with serving God. And I think that he is disoriented. I think that he is disillusioned. And what was Peter before Jesus called him? He was a fisherman. It was his business. It was his career. And Peter was saying, it's back to business as usual. I'm going off mission, off vision, off calling. I'm going back to do what I know how to do best because it looks like this ministry gig is just done. And he takes several others with him. He is bailing on Christ. And wouldn't you know that Christ would show up on the beach? Jesus will intersect with our disillusionment with serving God. And he will walk that beach with you and and try to put you back on mission, on vision, on calling, and put you back into focus. Now, you know the story. Peter goes out, and they fish all night, and they catch nothing. Now, I have to tell you, if you're just out on a day trip, and you get skunked, it's no big deal. But if it is the first day of your new business, it is a big deal. So Peter catches nothing all night. And the text says that Christ shows up on the beach as, as dawn is beginning to come. And he basically says, how are you guys doing out there? You like it off mission, off calling? He says, catch anything? Now you need to know something, that Christ shows up and he never asked questions in the gospel because he didn't know the answer. He always asks questions to make a point. And he's making one big point here. They did not know who he was. I mean, to them, he was just some guy walking on the beach wanting to know how good fishing was that night. And they say, we haven't caught anything. And so he says, well, try this. Try throwing your net on the other side of the boat. <laughs> they must have been desperate because they tried it. And in their book, this is not some command from God. This is them not knowing who they was, who he was. So they say, well, we'll give this a try. And boom. Their nets immediately fill up with fish so much that the nets were beginning to break. And John, who in the text calls himself the one who Jesus loved, says, Peter, it's the Lord. Brilliant conclusion. And this is such a Peter response. Peter, Peter wraps his garment around himself. And the text says that they were about 100 feet from the shore, which this is 60 feet you know, uh, 40 feet longer than this room. And he jumps into the water and, and he goes flying through the water to the shore while all of the others are still back in the boat trying to drag this gigantic net filled with fish to the shore. You know that part of the story, but, but do you know what strikes me? Now take your minds back to the fifth chapter of Luke. 
at the very beginning of Peter's ministry. Christ is teaching these crowds and crowds are pressing in on him. And and he sees a couple of guys over on the side and they're mending their nets by a boat. And he says, could you guys push me offshore just a little bit so I can stand in your boat and teach? One of those guys was Peter. So they push the boat off of the shore. Christ finishes his teaching and he turns to Peter in the boat and he says, how's fishing, by the way? Peter says, terrible. We fished all night. We didn't catch anything. And Christ says, well, try this. Put your nets on the other side of the boat. And sure enough, they did. And their nets immediately filled with fish to the place where the nets were about to break. And so struck was Peter that he falls on his knees before Jesus and he says, depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. But look at what Jesus said. He said in verse 10, do not be afraid. From now on, you will be catching men. That was Peter's call to the ministry. Do you think it accidental that when Peter is ready to check out of ministry that Christ reduplicates the moment of his calling? I think not. This is a major deja vu moment for Peter. So Peter, he jumps out of the boat to get to Jesus as quick as he can because Christ wants to remind him of his calling before you sign up. For that that membership in the National Association of Disenchanted Servants of Jesus. Could you right now with me just go back to that time that God worked in your heart. And you felt a call on your life to serve God. Do you remember? Do you remember that day? That moment? Why is it that you said yes? Yes. What really happened? I remember being challenged by a youth pastor, Coleman Pratt, Baptist Church in Orlando, Florida. I was in the ninth grade, and he literally challenged us to become full-time servants of God. And I decided right then and there that the only thing for me was to stand up and preach the word of God. Now, I want to be fair to Peter in all of this. I mean, Judas is gone. The treasury is bankrupt. Where is he going to get food to eat? Where is he going to get sustenance? I mean, it would be a very natural impulse to take matters into your own hands, take care of your own situation. So Peter goes back to the old way, back off of vision, off of mission, mission, at least as a fisherman, he can eat. He can pay his bills. He can keep clothes on his back. So not only does Christ remind Peter of his calling, but Christ assures Peter that he is sufficient to meet all of his needs. Because just watch how the story unfolds. Peter, he runs to the shore to see the Lord. And the text says that Jesus is on the shore and he has built this charcoal fire. This is an aside. You know how aromas can catch your memory bank? The burning leaves in the fall. Someone's wearing your grandmother's perfume. Cut grass in the summertime. Aromas can trigger so many things for us. When was the last time that Peter was around a charcoal fire? I just wonder if Peter smelling the charcoal fire and seeing Jesus. I wonder if all of that stuff of his failure just did not come right back up into his heart. We never call this his second failure. But I believe the tender, forgiving touch of Jesus became a motivating, loving reality in his life. Because this is his second failure. And I just, I just need to tell you that in some respects, it is far worse than his first failure. 
failure. The first was so dramatic. It was so out of the ordinary. It was so blatant. It was so obviously wrong that no wonder when the cock crowed three times, Peter just bowed in abject sorrow and he repented before the Lord. He begged for forgiveness. It was big. But going off mission, off vision is a lot subtler than that. There are a lot more reasons that we may feel why it's okay to do. But this is Peter's second failure. And I, under, I think that Christ understands that, that Peter went back to the occupation of fishing because he had to be self-sufficient. And this is what I love about this story. Peter, he just comes dripping out of the waves, walking up to Jesus. And Christ has built this fire and he has some fish on the fire. So where did he get the fish from? I mean, do you, do you think Jesus had been fishing all night? Where did he get those fish? He happens to be the king of the sea. It was no problem. But don't you think it may have caught Peter's attention that there were already fish on that fire? He called the rest of the disciples and the text says they came and just like fishermen, they counted the fish. They measured them. Then Christ said, now that you have brought your fish in, come have the breakfast that I have prepared for you. You've heard of the last supper. Well, this is the last breakfast. And it is important because you need to know that I believe that this is the underlying message that Christ is trying to get across. Don't worry about your needs. I will supply for you. The Bible teaches that spirituality is a supply side economics. He calls, we serve, he supplies. That's the way it has always worked. And yet we get so quickly distracted by our own needs. Something that you need to be reminded of is this. Your boss is not in charge of your income. God is in charge of your income. And if you don't like what you're getting paid, go talk to the Lord about it. He might just put it into perspective for you. God will take care of you. God will take care of me. Let me ask you a simple question. What is it that has distracted you from the core of serving God? The core is simple. We do what we do because we love Jesus. I wanted to talk to you about this before we enter into this new year ahead to maybe help realign your focus on why it is that you serve God. He is the one who is calling us and he is the one who will supply. And since that is true, you are free to do it for Jesus and Jesus alone. So what has changed? He called you. Has the call changed? Has Christ changed? Has the cause changed? We've changed. That's what's changed. It's not the call or Christ. We are the ones who went and grabbed our fishing poles. And I'm telling you, in this year ahead, Christ is calling you back to vision back to mission, back to calling. He's calling you back to love him, to love him enough to serve him regardless of the environment that you find yourself in. So if you, if you would, I'm going to ask you to, to recommit to this call from Christ on your life. A call to serve Jesus by serving other people. You see, we need you here at the fort to be fully committed to the call of Christ. And if that is you, would you just stand up in your place?
My prayer is that when Christ sees our heart, he can see the anthem of our soul as being more deeply committed to the call on our life than ever before, simply because we love him. And I pray that as he looks at your heart, he doesn't see a sign hanging that reads, gone fishing.